Next up, we have Dave Vandenbout giving a talk called Schematics, the Heroine of Electronic Design. Dave Vandenbout is the creator of KaiCost, Keyfield, and Skittle. Dave formerly ran Excess, an FPGA board company that created accessible designs for people looking to utilize FPGAs in their projects. Dave will be talking about Skittle and how to replace the graphical component of your design with code. Please welcome uh, Dave to the stage. Uh, can everybody hear me? Okay, I'll assume that, yes. Chris, uh, thank you so much for inviting me to uh, give a talk uh, so long ago, back in November. Uh, my girlfriend found out that I was going to be an invited speaker here. I've never been an invited speaker anywhere. I've also never been invited back anywhere. <laughs> and uh, she asked me, well, how much do they pay you for something like that? And uh, <laughs> then I put on this shirt, and she said, well, they're not paying you shit. <laughs> anyway. I'm going to go back and we're going to take a trip through time at the start of this talk. We're going to go to the dawn of time, 1968. Dawn for a lot of you guys, but for me, I was in the seventh grade and this is my very first schematic. Uh, this is a sweetie. It's a, a nine volt dry cell that was about as big as my forearm. Uh, big old knife switches, ceramic and copper, and a GE light bulb. This is a great schematic. I even, I'll even rate it for you. The amount of effort it took to make that was very small, which is really important when you're 12 years old. And the clarity, uh, clarity of it is very high. It's very easy to tell what it does. Uh, there's no mysteries there. Let's go forward now, seven more years. 1975, I am a sophomore in college. Yay, me! <laughs> and op amps are the thing for me now. This is a 741 op amp. Uh, it's uh, getting up there. It's not a, as simple a schematic as the last one, but it's made out of simple elements, 20 transistors, 11 resistors, and one lone capacitor. Let's give this a rating. It's a little bit more effort, more stuff, more time, more effort, and the clarity is down a little bit, but it's not really uh, that unclear when you think about it. It's got differential input stage. You can recognize current mirrors, level shifters, totem pole outputs. Looks pretty good. Let's go forward six more years, 1981, my third year at Bell Laboratories. Yay, me. And microprocessors are the rage. This is an 80, 80 board. We were using 8088s, but uh, it's the same thing. They all look the same. And oh, oy vey, this looks a lot different than the op amp does. A uh, lot more parallel buses, digital buses. You can no longer look at a signal line in, in isolation at a particular time. And uh, the, all these are buses and they, they move over time. You have to look at multiple transactions over those buses. You've got this whoosh whoosh of data going back and forth between the processor and the memory. And uh, so time is much more important in this circuit than it is in the previous two. And also, these are programmable devices, so how they behave is all determined by the program, and the program is not shown in the schematic. It's off in somebody else's head. So how do you rate this one? Well, bigger schematic, more time, more effort. And clarity has gone down because, well, it's got programmable devices, so you can't really tell what, that, that thing could be a development board, it could be a, a motor control for a, a, a gas station pumps, so you can't really tell. Go forward to 1995, I enter middle age, yay me. 84, 86 motherboard, and just more of the same, but more. Now we've got much wider buses, we've got much higher pin count chips, and notice they're not drawing the buses between chips anymore, they're just stubbing them off on the chip, and they're just saying, it, it goes somewhere, uh, go find it. And this schematic is 17 pages long, Here's another one, isn't that nice? Uh, there is one lone bus going between two chips, so maybe there is a future for them. But uh, let's rate this schematic. Effort, really high to make that. Clarity, really low, for the same reasons I've already talked about. Lots of buses, time, behavior, programmability. Let's go forward to 2000 and beyond. I was struggling for a, some kind of signpost in my life for this. All I could come up with was uh, kidney stones. But kidney stones are not anywhere near as painful as this schematic. <laughs> this is a development board for a Xilinx Vertex 7 FPGA. It's a 1700 pin chip. And it's just page after page after page of 
of the banks of the FPJ, and they're just stubbed off, and they go somewhere. And uh, there's some more. There's some MGTs with their power supply. Oh, looky, ground, <laughs> grounds, lots and lots of grounds. Uh, and we can't forget our friends the bypass capacitors. And these are just the bypass capacitors for the FPJ. There's lots of other chips, and they all have theirs as well. So let's rate this one. We, we pegged the meter. We blew the engine out on this thing. The effort is off the scale. The clarity is zero. And that's, you know, that's where we are. Let's look at the progression of this. Oops. Too far. I blew it. I started off small, and things were great. Didn't take a lot of effort. Things worked. I kept making bigger and bigger somatic. I kept putting more and more effort into them. I kept getting less and less insight out of them, and it was just wearing me out. And I looked at this progression, and I said, I recognize this from all those afternoons spent watching the ABC afternoon special on TV. This is the pathway to drug addiction. <laughs> this is where the kid starts off with a nickel bag, and by the end of the show, he's... He's down on 2nd Street with John Belushi, and he's doing speed balls. And that's why I named this talk Schematics, the Heroin of Electronic Design, because we're just hooked on, but they're killing us. Now, if you know anything about addiction, <laughs> of course I wouldn't, but if you know anything about addiction, you know that the only way to, the way most people get out of addiction is they just finally hit rock bottom, and they wake up and they say, I don't know what my, was intended for my life, but this isn't it. So things are going to have to change. And when people do that, the rest of us mostly don't notice because, well, we got our own lives to lead and we're, we got our own stuff that's going on, so yay me. But, uh, and, you know, and screw everybody else. But even though it, most of the times they're, they're lost, we have a chance to see one moment of clarity it's captured in time on the KiCad Info Forum. And you can go and look at this, at this thread, and it's there. This was a guy, Alex Lopez, who came out and said, I'd like to create netlist information from non-graphical tools. Alex is having his moment of clarity. He said, it's typing faster than drawing. Computers are handled text great. Every OS has a text editor. Scripts automate tasks. And searching is straightforward. I, saw what Alex was saying, and I had a moment of clarity myself. And I said, that's a great idea. That's such a great idea. I wonder if anybody's done that before. It's been done before. It's been done before more than once. The one I found was PhDL, and it was done at Brigham Young University by uh, some researchers there, and they wrote it in Java. They wrote it in Java because they wanted it to be used everywhere. They said, you'll be able to design schematics on laptops and and tablets and on phones. They were so ambitious. But PHDL died. This is the forum traffic. It peaked in 2012, and that was pretty much it. Nobody, uh, there may be some monks somewhere that are still using it. I don't know. But uh, as scavengers have taught us, there's a lot of value in dead things. They're tasty, and they don't fight back. So what are the tasty bits that PHDL laid out before us? Well, it had concise, repetitive part instantiation. Make a lot of parts very easily. And it had concise bulk connectivity, a way to put the wires in between them without having to put each individual wire in there. And it had the twin hammers of modular design, encapsulation, and hierarchy. So that was great. But when something you find something that's dead and tasty, the first thing you ask, well, first thing I would ask, maybe you would, why in the hell is that thing dead, and is it going to kill me if I eat it? <laughs> so why did PHDL die? <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, it was very problem-specific. It did one thing. It did schematics. So there's, a, you know, pro there's not that many people do, who do schematics compared to people that do JavaScript. It lacked general purpose capabil capabilities. It did schematics, and uh, it had the tools for doing that, but not much else. Uh, you know, liken it to uh, Eagle's ULP language. You know, it does a lot of stuff, but eventually you reach the boundary, and it stops doing things for you, and it's, it's not quite like C. So it, uh, PHDL had the same kind of problem, only more so. 
uh, had no ecosystem, no libraries, no utilities to go around it to make it, to make it easier to use. And it had no user community. It was like this. It's like a little girl, got a favorite toy, goes out in the desert, plunks it down, and then gets sad because there's nobody to play with it. Well, sweetheart, nobody's going to go all the way out in the desert to play with a damn merry-go-round. Uh, eh, except for this guy. <laughs> so it really turns into a social problem. How do you get people to use the language so that it doesn't die? I knew about a language that, that had not died and still hasn't died called MyHDL. And it was built upon Python, a good general purpose language with a lot of users. And they just added objects for describing digital hardware and put in a functional simulation engine for simulating uh, digital hardware in Python. And then it would output VHDL or Verilog at the end. And you could put it into your synthesis tools and do all the heavy lifting of actually designing FPGAs and ASICs. And I thought, well, that's a good idea. Maybe we can take PHDL and MyHDL and put them together. And I made something called Skittle, which stands for Schematic KiCad Design Language, which is about as good as I could come up with. It uses Python for general purpose computing, so it's a general purpose language. I just add a couple of parts, uh, a couple of objects to it for parts and nets. I provide methods for interconnecting them and output a net list to PCB new, which does all the heavy lifting of making actual circuit boards. There are four basic Skittle objects. Pin, you know what a pin is. Got a number, a name, an IO type, all this drive level, things like that. A part is a bag of pins. I know people like to think of parts as like these boxes with, with pins coming out of the sides of them. I, when you work with Skittle, just give up that idea. It's just a big old bag of pins. And a net is just a connection between one or more pins, and a bus is just a bunch of nets. And those are the Skittle objects. Let's start off with a part. This is a very simple uh, part that I, I placed into an object called UC for microcontroller, and it just goes into one of the KiCad libraries, my MCU microchip PIC-10 and it picks a particular device out of there called the PIC-10 F220 and makes an object that's microcontroller. And there it is. And if you just type it in the interpreter and let it go, it'll tell you about itself. So tell us about yourself. And it says, I'm a 512, you know, 512 word flash. It just reads it through the description that's in KiCad, the, the KiCad symbol library, and it lists out all of its pins and what they do. Then you want to do things like create nets. That's easy. There, just make a net. That's a net. That's an unnamed net. And there's a net that's got a name. There's a bus, a five-pin bus, and it has a name. All buses have to have names because you want to be able to refer to them. And then you want to connect pins and nets together because you're making a net list. We use the, Chi, uh, we use the Python indexing operator to access pins from devices and nets from buses. And we use the plus equals operator just to connect stuff together. And we connect all kinds of stuff together, pins and pins and nets and buses and whatever, pins to pins. Let's look at some of that. That's microcontroller pin 5, and that connects it to that net that we made in the previous page. That's the connection. We don't have to do it that way. We can say, let's connect microcontroller pin 3 and microcontroller pin 4 together. And that's an implicit net, so you don't have to explicitly make the net. You can connect a, a bus to a part. And this takes three, uh, takes four bit bus and connects it to microcontroller pins GP3, 2, 1, and 0, which is a lot to write out if you've got a 32 bit bus. So there's a shorthand method for doing that. Now, what I've just shown you here, that's 80% of Skittle. Uh, you could go and, and probably write good linear Skittle right now just knowing that. So let's do an example. This is a very simple uh, voltage divider that is. Uh, taking an input voltage, dividing it down, and then applying that to the analog to digital converter pin of a, of a PIC-10 F200. Uh, I, I tend to stay with the PICs in these examples. I, I'm not quite sure why. I'm going to do that in Skittle. First, I'm going to define three nets, VDD, power supply, the ground, and the voltage input. Then I'm going to define, uh, define a resistor, R1, which has a value of 4.7K. I'm going to copy R1, make it identical, and, but just change the value to 2.2K, and that'll be R2. 
Then I'm going to take the voltage, the input voltage applied to the first pin of R1. I'm going to take the, the second pin of R1 and connect it to the first pin of R2. And then I'm going to put R2 in and connect the other end of it to ground. That's my voltage divider. Then I'm going to instantiate my microcontroller part. I'm going to connect the power and the ground to the power on the ground lines that I have. And last but not least, I connect the GP0 pin to the junction point where the two resistors meet. And I just selected first pin of R2 to do that. And that's the same thing as what that schematic shows you. Now, which one is easier to do? If you're a schematic guy, the schematic's easier. If you're a programmer guy, maybe the programmer is easier. Which one is more explicative? Which one is clearer? I think we've got to hand it to the schematic that that is much clearer to look at than the skittle is. You know, schematics are not all bad. Uh, and on, on small, small circuits, they work very well. The problem is circuits don't stay small. They grow, they grow up. All right, does anybody know what this is? Louder. I got 63 year old ears. Charlie Plex. Charlie Plex, there you go. We're going to do that in Skittle. We're going to make a bus that's four bits long. We're going to loop through each net on that bus. And then we're going to have an inner loop. We're going to loop through the bus again. And we're going to look for two pins that, no, two, two nets that aren't the same. So if those two nets aren't the same, then I know I have two different nets in that bus. Then I'm going to create an LED, and I'm going to connect the high net to the anode. I'm going to connect the low net uh, to the cathode, and that makes my Charlie Plex LEDs. Now, which one is easier to do? Uh, I tend to think that the loop is easier, especially if it, instead of four, uh, four bit bus, you've got a 10 bit bus. But uh, some people still may like to lay it out by hand. I laid that out by hand. I hated it. Here's two Charlie Plex designs uh, at once. We're going to do that. We're going to do that with a module, make a sub-circuit module, which is really just a Python uh, subroutine. We're going to call it Charlie Plex LEDs, and we're going to pass a parameter to it, which is a bus. And we're also going to pass to it an LED in case you want to change the type of LED you use. And then we just put the loop in there, and that loop goes and loops through whatever bus you pass to it, and it makes, it makes the uh, uh, Charlie Plex display. So you make two buses, a 4-bit bus and a 5-bit bus, and you say Charlie Plex on B1, Charlie Plex on B2, and boom, boom, you're done. Now, which one's easier to do? I, I think we're getting to the point where Skittle is easier than laying out the schematic, because I did that schematic, and I hated it even more. Example four, last example, I promise. Making, uh, we, we put out our VDD and ground pins, uh, ground nets. We make a capacitor template that we're going to use later on. We put down our microcontroller. In this case, it's a 16F83. We're going to connect the power and ground pins on that uh, microcontroller. Then we're going to make a bypass capacitor, 10 microfarads. We're going to connect that bypass capacitor to the VDD and VSS lines. So the micro will run. Then we make a crystal. And we connect the oscillator one and two pins of the microcontroller. We connect it to that crystal. Then we make a pair of trim capacitors. Then we connect first trim capacitor to one leg of the crystal and ground, and the second trim capacitor to the other side of the crystal and ground. And at the very end, we do all the heavy lifting. We make a Charlie Plex LED display that's connected to uh, port B of the microcontroller. And we make a Charlie Plex switch matrix that's connected to port A. And the switch matrix, the Charlie Plex switch matrix, is the same as the Charlie Plex LED matrix. It just uses a switch and a diode in place of an LED. Now, that's all academic there. It doesn't really do anything. So what do you have to do? You have to generate the netlist at the end of that. And so that will output a netlist that you can then pull into PCB new. And there it is. Skittle uh, maintains the hierarchy of your design so uh, PCB new can work with it and place it hierarchically. hierarchically. Uh, at the top, you see the, LA, uh, you see the uh, uh, Charlie Plex switch array with the diodes and the switches. At the lower right, you see the Charlie Plex LEDs. And at the lower left is the microcontroller, its uh, bypass cap, and its uh, crystal, and its two trim caps. So that all works out 
that, that gives you an idea of the flow of what goes on with Skittle. Where did the footprints come from? I didn't mention a footprint anywhere at all in there. Well, they actually had to be specified by a string like that, which is why I didn't put them in the presentation because there's not enough width on the screen. I just have to go find where the footprint is in the KiCad libraries and use that. There used to be a great tool called CVPCB where I could use that on the netlist and assign all the footprints that way, but I don't know, somewhere that got lost. And parts, where do the parts come from? How do you find parts? Uh, I, mean, I mean, it's easy with the e schema. You pull up a list and you select a part and you dump it on the board. In my case, uh, I have a thing called search and you just type in the name of, you know, some part of the name of a part and it'll go out and it'll search all the directories and all the libraries and it'll find every place where that string occurs and then you just pick what you want from that. Skittle fixes common problems, common problems for me. Trivialities. I don't have all the trivialities like junction dot size. I've heard engineers have a conversation about junction dot size. I've heard engineers have conversations about wire width. I've heard engineers have conversations about the color of the background of symbols. If I ever get involved in a conversation like that, I am going to blow my head right off. Repetitive parts. You want a thousand bypass capacitors? I got a thousand bypass caps for you right there, and I can hook them up too. Mistaken disconnection. Sometimes you'll move a schematic one way or the other. It's maybe a part will fall off of a wire, and then, then it's not on the wire anymore, and it's a disconnection. You can't do that with Skittle because that just doesn't happen with text. Uh, power flags, I'm not going to go through that right now. Version control works. If it just works. And multiple boards in one project, if you want to put multiple boards in the same file, you can drop those out. Uh, you know, it'll poop them out like turds. Freebies. Everybody loves freebies because it means less work. I was in Skittle and I said, I want to do E96 resistor values. I'm going to have to write some routine to figure out what all those are. Nope, somebody did that for me. He wrote a set of tools to just put out all the different E-series resistors and capacitor values you'd ever want. I said, well, I want to find a way to kind of resolve some of these resistor values in my designs. Sometimes they're 4.7K, sometimes they're 4K7, sometimes it's 4700. How do I make sure that I know all those are the same value? I'll have to write a routine for that. Nope, this guy did it. Normalizing values. I said, that's great. And then I said, I want to be able to do spice simulations with Skittle. Nope, somebody else did it, PySpice. I had to make a little bit of an interface between PySpice and Skittle, but you know, not anywhere near as bad as the interface with NGSpice. I said, I want to optimize my circuits. I had to write optimization programs and make them better. Nope, somebody did it. Here's a, an example of using the last two, and I'm getting towards the end. How am I doing on time? OK. I'm good. I might have time for a song. Uh, anyway, the generative circuits, this was big in academia a while ago, but take a seed circuit, describe it in Skittle, have Skittle pump it through to PySpice, and then have PySpice pump it through to NGSpice and simulate it. NGSpice dumps the simulation results back to PySpice, and then PySpice takes those simulation results, puts them into nice Python variables, arrays, and, and, uh, and structures, and things like that and sends it back to scipy.optimize. If you have an objective function that you're trying to optimize on your circuit, scipy.optimize takes that and the, and the behavior of the circuit, starts jiggling it around a little bit, takes the jiggled circuit, passes it back to Skittle, and we do the loop over and over and over again till we optimize some function, in theory. This is a multi-level voltage regulator that I was designing design just to see what I could do with it. It's a three-terminal adjustable regulator, and I took eight resistors and eight switches, and I said, how can I connect those together so that by opening and closing the switches, I can get the most number of different supply voltages out of that regulator? Uh, yes. that's, that's actually the circuit that I came up with, and it's pretty symmetrical, and it's pretty, you know, it's really not very complicated. I turned the machine loose on that, and it came up with this. And I don't even know how that works, but 
there it is. And so I said, well, who, you know, who's the winner? You know, John Henry or, or me? So man versus machine. The blue, that's the ones that I created. And the gold is the ones the machine created. And the machine beat me. Uh, I mean, they're both reasonably good, but the machine's is not as clumpy as, as mine is. So I got a score of 0.85. The machine got a score of 0.52. So it beat me just like John Henry got beat. Documentation. It's Python. It's easy to document. Python comments, you know, doc strings, Sphinx, Autodoc. You can make tons of great documentation. You can attach notes to circuits, parts, nets, pins, buses. I haven't got that into Skittle yet, but it's ready to go in. And the 800-pound gorilla of documentation is Jupyter. You can take Jupyter and just put it around whatever you're doing, and you can make a nice notebook. Uh, you can put in uh, videos. You can put in uh, images. You can put in live calculations. You can make an entire notebook about your circuit, and it'll update every time you update the circuit. And you can even run the notebook, and it'll output your circuit. This is an example of that, a very simple one, just a, uh, a spice simulation that I put together of a transmission line. Now, I know a lot of people are really excited about being able to take EE schema and put a figure in there, you know, a bitmap figure. You should absolutely love Jupiter if that's the kind of thing you like to do. So, all is said and done, where are we? Little girl, again, back in the playground this time, not in the desert. All of her friends are around. She's not the uh, center of attention, but that was never the point. She's playing with her toy, and they're playing with theirs. If they want to come over and play with her toy, that's fine. They can do that. If they want to stick with their own, that's fine. They can do that. That's the way things are meant to be, freedom. And it's, all, it, it's, a, it's a pretty good place to end up at, I think, except for this guy. He's still there. And that's what his purpose is. He takes away the things that aren't useful anymore. So everything has a beginning and maybe everything should have an end. And that's the end of this talk with the playground rules. If you want to install Skittle, it's pip install Skittle. It runs Python 2, Python 3. It's just pure Python. There's nothing to it. Design examples are over there. And I even provide a handy netlist convert. If you've got an EE uh, schema netlist, you run it through there and it'll dump Skittle code out of the other end of it. Very simple, linear Skittle code, but it gives you an idea of what it looks like. That's it. I can't do no more.